The images that portray our national heritage are many and diverse, but none so clearly symbolizes the birth of our nation as a single piece of parchment housed in the National Archives, the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of Independence approved by the Second Continental Congress on July 4, 1776, established our nation and announced to the world that we were no longer bound to Great Britain. The courageous patriots representing the 13 original colonies in America, men like Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, and John Adams, called the First Continental Congress a year earlier, in 1775, to express their grievances with Great Britain. They had complaints against England's treatment of the colonies. Back in 1775, their grievances were serious, but there was still enough loyal sentiment to prevent breaking ties with the mother country. Although the colonists wanted the right to shape their own destinies, they wanted to do it with England's blessings, certainly without having to wage war. Uh, the Americans were brought into independence basically dragging and screaming, saying they didn't want to go, and they accepted it only because they determined by the middle of 1776 that they didn't have an alternative. Dr. Pauline Mayer, professor of history, MIT, Professor Mayer is the author of American Scripture, Making the Declaration of Independence. If they didn't declare their independence, they were going to be destroyed. For over 150 years, men and women from the British Isles and Europe had been braving 3,000 miles of treacherous ocean in small boats to find freedom on the American continent. These refugees from political and religious oppression, from war and poverty, were building a new world for a new kind of people. They wanted peace and prosperity in their new homeland. These were Britain's colonies, established by royal charter, governed by royal appointees, subject to British laws and dependent on the mother country for supplies and trade. Britain's armies protected the colonies from domination by the French and from Indian attack. All the Americans started out loyal to Britain. By the mid-18th century, Britain's Atlantic colonies had grown into thriving communities. The total population of 1.5 million was primarily native-born, young, male, aggressive. Mobility, both social and geographical, marked this new society of transplanted Englishmen. There was no limit to the wealth and position a man might achieve in America if he had courage and initiative and was willing to work. But in order to keep control of the wealth and trade of these ambitious people, Britain's government tried to impose on the colonists the same limitations that had caused their forefathers to leave the old country. Peter Kalm, a Swedish university professor, had this observation when he visited America in 1748. The colonists are forbidden to establish new manufactures which would turn to the disadvantage of the British commerce. They are not allowed to dig for any gold or silver unless they send them to England immediately. They have not the liberty of trading to any parts that do not belong to the British Dominion and foreign traders are not allowed to send their ships to them. His observations led him to conclude, the English colonies of North America in the space of 40 or 50 years would be able to form a state by themselves entirely independent of old England. His prediction proved amazingly accurate. During the next 25 years, the primary grievance American colonists had with Great Britain was the levying of taxes without representation and the making of laws without the consent of the governed. Severing ties with Great Britain came gradually and painfully. The inhabitants of the colonies included many loyalists to the motherland and early attempts to unite in a common cause for independence failed. But by 1774, the strong hand of royal power was tightening around the rebellious American colonies. 
British leaders claimed the mother country could make any laws she pleased for them. King George III even went so far as to close down the lawmaking bodies in some colonies for a while. Americans, however, did not intend to give up the right of making their own laws. They saw that they must act together in order to get England to listen to them. Delegates from 12 colonies met in the First Continental Congress in Philadelphia. Hoping for a peaceful settlement of the quarrel, they wrote a letter to King George. They begged him to give the colonists their rights. The young, stubborn king did not even answer the letter. Meanwhile, British soldiers had been sent to Boston, Massachusetts to see that new laws made in England were obeyed. Angry colonists had been arming themselves in case it should be necessary to fight for their rights. In April 1775, the British learned that gunpowder was hidden outside of Boston and Concord. Their red-coated soldiers marched there to capture it. On the way, at Lexington, Massachusetts, they clashed with some armed Americans. Eight Americans were killed. The shot that was heard around the world had been fired. The Revolutionary War had started. The next month, the Second Continental Congress began meeting. Congress chose George Washington as commander of the army to defend the colonies. Although fighting was going on in New England, most people did not want to break away from Britain. They still hoped to make the king give them their rights as British citizens. But early in 1776, word reached America that the king had sent many more British soldiers and even hired thousands of German mercenaries to put down the American rebellion. This news filled Americans with anger. During the spring of 1776, the idea of separating from Great Britain grew rapidly. Yet, not all colonists were convinced they should take the final step in cutting ties with Great Britain. On Friday, June 7, 1776, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, delegates to the Second Continental Congress met at the State House. The president of the Congress was John Hancock of Massachusetts. After Mr. Hancock took care of some regular business, Richard Henry Lee of Virginia stood up and announced, Upon instructions of my government in Virginia, I present the following resolution. Resolved that these united colonies are, and of right ought to be free and independent states. That they are absolved from all allegiance to the British Crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is, and ought to be, totally dissolved. Congress passed Lee's motion on June 8th and began the debate for and against declaring independence. It's important to understand that the major debate over independence in the Second Continental Congress occurred well before the resolutions were adopted. They were held in a committee of the whole on June 8th and June 10th. That is the Saturday and a Monday, the Sunday they didn't meet. Uh, they, they went thoroughly over all the arguments for and against declaring independence. The opponents said they understood by that point that it was inevitable that the Americans would become independent. But several delegations had instructions from their home legislature that said they could not vote for a resolution in favor of independence. And it was hoped that those resolutions could be rescinded before a final vote came up. The proponents of putting off independence argued that America was too weak to defend herself against the mighty British Empire. Before declaring independence, the colonies should get the promise of help from some other country, like France or Spain. The proposition's supporters responded that Lee's resolution called on Congress only to declare a fact which already exists. Until the colonies declared their independence, no European power could negotiate with them, receive an ambassador, or even allow American ships to enter their ports. By the end of the day, it became clear that only seven colonies would vote yes. They were Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Virginia, Georgia, 
and North Carolina. But it was necessary that all 13 colonies vote for independence. They must stay united. Otherwise, the Americans would not be strong enough to defeat the British and build a new nation. So that was the circumstance. What the Congress decided to do on June 10th was to delay a final vote on the resolutions that Richard Henry Lee had introduced on behalf of independence. But, uh, it would, uh, the Congress did not intend to take up the resolution again until early July, but just in case that it then decided to approve it, as it most likely would, it appointed a committee to draft a declaration. Now, the purpose of the declaration was to justify and to announce the decision for independence, primarily to the American people, I believe. So on June 11th, the Congress appointed this committee to, to have a draft uh, for it to consider if and when it voted in favor of independence. The committee had five members. Thomas Jefferson of Virginia, John Adams, a Massachusetts delegate, Pennsylvania's Benjamin Franklin, Roger Sherman of Connecticut, and Robert R. Livingston from New York. The best known member is, of course, Thomas Jefferson, who became the draftsman of the Declaration. Uh, but his role was probably not as extensive as he later claimed it to, it to have been. Uh, the other members of particular importance were Benjamin Franklin and John Adams. Uh, but the two other members, Richard R. Livingston of New York and Roger Sherman of Connecticut, were not insignificant. Jefferson himself was young, 33. He had only arrived after a respite in Virginia in the middle of May. Uh, he was known as a particularly good writer for Congress. Uh, Congress had its basically its writer's corps. When they had public documents to draft, they had a handful of people they would call on over and over again. So he was a very appropriate person to be given this responsibility. John Adams is quoted as saying, Jefferson had the reputation of a masterly pen. Therefore, when the five men came together in committee to create the Declaration of Independence, it was Jefferson who was called on to write it. The word declaration, used in political or legal terms, has strong meaning. A declaration announces, and for all practical purposes, enacts a new policy. It's also a legal instrument, a written statement of claims served on the defendant at the commencement of a civil action and brings charges of wrongdoing in an emphatic way while appealing for public support. Jefferson knew this and wrote the Declaration with care, searching for just the right words. He crossed out words and added new ones. He was determined, as he put it, to place before mankind the common sense of the subject and make the Declaration of Independence an expression of the American mind. Jefferson stayed in this boarding house while in Philadelphia. Now called the Declaration House, it was here he wrote his draft of the Declaration of Independence. When Jefferson's draft of the Declaration was completed, he submitted it to the committee. John Adams and Ben Franklin made a few small changes, and 17 days after the committee was formed, their work was completed. On June 28th, they presented the draft of the Declaration to John Hancock, who presided over the Congress. The Declaration was put to the delegates of the 13 colonies, who now had a monumental decision to make. To approve it and face the wrath of the mighty British Empire, or reject it and return the colonies to the misery of more oppression. England was determined to put down the American Rebellion, and even before Congress made a decision, the British fleet had arrived at America's shores. As the Second Continental Congress sat down to debate independence in Philadelphia, the British were arriving off Manhattan, and it must have been a fantastic scene. First 50 ships, then another 50, all coming toward Manhattan with their sails aloft, uh, they were about to mount the most powerful campaign, both by sea and by land, to put down this pesky rebellion. 
It was on that day, July 2nd, 1776, when the 13 American colonies all voted yes, that we became free and independent. On that day, a new nation called the United States of America was born. In order to understand this document better, let's break it down into its various parts in its unedited form as Jefferson wrote it. First, the preamble, the opening sentence that states the purpose of the document. The first paragraph of the Declaration is in some ways the most novel. We remember the second paragraph, but the first paragraph begins when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected with them with another. Compare that to most similar documents, the English Declaration of Rights, for example, uh, or the preamble to the Virginia Constitution, which the state of Virginia had adopted only a few weeks earlier. They begin, whereas. Uh, the, dr the drama uh, is, is much greater. And I think of what those words must have meant, for example, to American soldiers to whom the Declaration was read on Manhattan. They may have felt that they were just another underfinanced, undermanned army about to be destroyed by the greatest military power in the world. And the Declaration arrives that says, basically, this is an event of significance in human history. And it is an event, as the last line went on, to say that mankind will be interested. A decent respect for the opinions of mankind demands that we declare the causes of this separation. Uh, it puts the whole event on a much more heroic level. The second sentence has become the most famous and most quoted of the document. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are, are created, created equal, equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain uh, inalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. With those words, the founders of the country, even prior to the Constitution, placed the country's very existence on a unique footing. What they taught is that our basic rights as human beings, rights that have to be respected in the political order, are not the gifts of princes. They're not something bestowed on us by government. They're not the fruit of a social contract, an agreement that we'll leave each other alone or anything like that. Rather, these most fundamental human rights are gifts from God. They're natural rights that we have, not by virtue of citizenship as such, but by virtue of being human beings. The writers of the Declaration of Independence realized the document had multiple purposes. One, it meant to garner a decent respect to the opinions of mankind. The Declaration was a means of submitting its facts to a candid world. This meant influencing public opinion both at home and abroad. I think that the phrase in the first paragraph of the Declaration of Independence, which suggests it is written for mankind, from a decent respect for the opinions of mankind, is somewhat misleading. We think, therefore, it must be a, a world proclamation, and, and obviously to some extent it was, but I think the Declaration is written primarily for a domestic audience. The document is largely made up of charges against King George III, accusing him of a long train of abuses and a history of repeated injuries and usurpations over an extended period of time. Independence could be justified only if the charges against the king were convincing and of sufficient gravity to warrant dissolution of his authority over the American people. There are 29 charges against King George III listed point after point and arranged in ever-increasing seriousness from indignities to downright tyranny. By 1776, it was clear you could only end the reign of a living king for one of two reasons. The first I find particularly charming, that the king was a rex inutilis, uh, a useless king, or in other words, inept. If he's inept, you could get rid of him. Uh, and the other reason was that the king was evil. 
And evil had a particular implication, that is, that he had interfered with the rights and freedoms of the people. What the Americans said in 1776 is, we have the evil kind, and that's why we're getting rid of him. That was important. It's important, and I think it helps to explain why the Americans and some other countries which have grown out of the British tradition have constitutional crises rather than coup d'etat. Uh, it, it is an important precedent for political stability. Here are some of the charges. He has refused his assent to laws the most wholesome and necessary to the public good. He has forbidden his government to pass laws of immediate and pressing importance. Well, what I suppose is peculiar about the Declaration of Independence compared to rather similar documents that were issu issued by states and towns and counties is that it has such a long list of grievances. And they open with uh, uh, some that were very difficult to identify, particularly for people abroad, because they're stated in, general t in very general terms, and often they refer to events that were uh, played out on the local level and were not common to all of the colonies. He has refused to pass other laws for the accommodation of large districts of people. The opening paragraph, of course, begins not whereas, but when in the course of human events. And then instead of saying bye, bye, bye when he got to the grievances, he made it more emphatic. He has, he has, he has. He has called together legislative bodies at places unusual, uncomfortable, and distant from the depository of their public records for the sole purpose of fatiguing them into compliance with his measures. This probably referred to the royal governor's convening of the Massachusetts legislature in Cambridge. And loyalists like Thomas Jefferson were very quick to point out that Cambridge wasn't really all that far from Boston. Uh, it was not uncomfortable. It generally convened at Harvard College, and the legislatures could stay in the homes of professors, which were not uncomfortable. So it was seemed a rather cooked up provision. The next group of charges, however, could not be described as trivial or insignificant. He has combined with others, meaning the British Parliament, to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our constitutions and unacknowledged by our laws, giving his assent to their acts of pretended legislation for quartering large bodies of armed troops among us, for protecting them from punishment for any murders which they should commit on the inhabitants of these states, for cutting off our trade with all parts of the world, for imposing taxes on us without our consent, for depriving us of the benefits of trial by jury, for suspending our own legislatures and declaring themselves invested with power to legislate for us in all cases whatsoever. I think few people today would say that George III was a tyrant. We understand his motivation rather differently. I think the reason the Declaration attacks the king should be understood within a British constitutional context. The rule in Britain was the king can do no harm. The king was symbolic of the state and the ultimate authority of the state. In ordinary politics, people forbore attacking the king. They always said his minister was responsible for any policy, even if they thought the king was, was personally responsible for that policy. The only time that you could publicly attack the king was when you thought the depredations had gone so far, the grievances had gone so far, that the state had yielded its legitimacy. In other words, to attack the king was to announce revolution. In the third and concluding group of charges against the king, Jefferson cites the most recent and most serious offenses against the American people. He has abdicated government here, withdrawing his governors and declaring us out of his allegiance and protection. He has plundered our seas, ravaged our coasts, burnt our towns, and destroyed the lives of our people. He is, at this time, transporting large armies of foreign mercenaries to complete the works of death, desolation, and tyranny. He has incited treasonable insurrections of our fellow citizens with the allurements of forfeiture and confiscation of property. 
He has waged cruel war against human nature itself, violating its most sacred rights of life and liberty in the persons of a distant people who never offended him, captivating and carrying them into slavery in another hemisphere, or to incur miserable death in their transportation thither. This piratical warfare, the opprobrium of infidel powers, is the warfare of the Christian King of Great Britain. People are always struck by Jefferson's long, final grievance against the King, uh, and often it's misunderstood. It is taken to be an attack on the slave system, which it was not. It blamed the king for the slave trade, and it was written in such a way that it sounded as if the king had somehow personally piloted the ships to Africa, slashed the whip to get the slaves on board, piloted it west, sold the slaves, as if the king personally had carried on the slave trade, which, of course, was patently untrue. And I think that's one reason why the, uh, the Congress eliminated the provision. But why was Jefferson so angry about this? What, he, what really prompted his anger was the fact that the king had vetoed efforts on the part of the Virginia legislature to tax the importation of slaves. Following the charges against the king, Jefferson inserted a long paragraph of complaints about the British people. Among other things, there were these. We have been wanting in attentions to our British brethren. We have reminded them of the circumstances of our emigration and settlement here. They too have been deaf to the voice of justice and consanguinity. The road to happiness and to glory is open to us too. We will climb it apart from them and acquiesce in the necessity which denounces our eternal separation. We must forget our former love for them and to hold them as we hold the rest of mankind, enemies in war, in peace, friends. Uh, the end of the declaration in Jefferson's uh, draft uh, goes on and on with an attack on the British people. Uh, this is often forgotten today, but it was very important at the time, I think, because the American colonists hoped very much for the support of the British government against the depredations of their government. They saw evidence that the grievances the Americans were suffering were also suffered by the British. Some Americans hoped for a hands-across-the-sea revolution with uprisings in Britain and in America, and possibly even in Ireland. And when it didn't work and they were left to themselves, there was certainly a, a, a reservoir of anger, which comes out in Jefferson's draft. Then, on the basis of the charges, Jefferson wrote the concluding part of the Declaration of Independence in a very powerful and beautiful way. We, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America, this, by the way, was the first time the nation's name was used officially in any document, in general Congress assembled do, in the name and by authority of the good people of these states, reject and renounce all allegiance and subjection to the kings of Great Britain and all others who may thereafter claim by, through, or under them. Which meant a rejection not only of King George III, but all future kings, a rejection of monarchy, as well as of those public servants the king appoints. And further, we utterly dissolve all political connection which may heretofore have subsisted between us and the parliament or people of Great Britain. And finally, we do assert and declare these colonies to be free and independent states. And the wonderful closing sentence. And for the support of this declaration, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. That was the draft of the declaration presented to Congress by the drafting committee. And with the exception of several changes made by John Adams and Ben Franklin, it was Thomas Jefferson's work. Well, Jefferson later said that he borrowed from neither book nor pamphlet in composing the Declaration of Independence, but the letter in which he said this is rather ambiguous. It may be that the book he said he did not uh, use was Locke's Second Treatise of Government, and the pamphlet was a pamphlet by James Otis of Massachusetts.
But without a doubt, ideas and phrases remembered from his past reading had made their way into his text. Well, he had certain models, and certainly he had, in fact, a, an outline to work from, if John Adams was correct. John Adams said that when the drafting committee first met, it discussed the Declaration, and indeed it divided it into articles, and then put its instructions down on a piece of paper for the draftsman that it appointed. In other words, Jefferson began with a piece of paper that told him how to organize the document. It is possible, in fact, that the committee told him, incorporate some language like George Mason's draft Declaration of Rights of Virginia. Uh, that document had appeared in the Pennsylvania Gazette on June 12th, 1776, the day after the committee was appointed and conceivably the first day it met. Uh, and you will recall that the Virginia Declaration of Rights had a very familiar sounding line that all men are born equally free and independent. We know that Jefferson also used a draft constitution for Virginia that he had drafted. Virginia only used the preamble, which was for all practical purposes a Declaration of Independence. Undoubtedly, Jefferson's Declaration of Independence was written under the influence of such treatises as the Magna Carta, the works of English philosopher and political theorist John Locke, thinkers of the Enlightenment, and of course, the English Declaration of Rights of 1689. It was the declaration which formally ended the reign of James II and inaugurated that of William and Mary. It provided a very appropriate model of how to proclaim the end of an old regime and the beginning of a new one. The old regime was not going out quietly, however. The war continued to rage. As this was happening, the entire government of the United States, the legislative, the judicial, the executive, all of which was invested in the Continental Congress, sat down to debate independence, and then spent two days editing the document the committee had submitted for its consideration. The delegates left most of the opening paragraphs untouched, except Jefferson's inherent and unalienable rights became certain unalienable rights. More often, however, the delegates cut back or eliminated the most extreme and untenable assertions in the committee's draft. They also crossed out the phrase, for the truth of which we pledge a faith yet unsullied by falsehood. So the paragraph ended simply, to prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. The adjustments the delegates made to the individual charges against the king were mostly moderations of Jefferson's claims. They did, however, entirely eliminate Jefferson's long passage accusing the king of trading in slaves. The contradiction was obvious. Many of the delegates themselves owned slaves, Jefferson included. Congress also shortened Jefferson's attack on the British people to a more lean and constrained statement. It also added two references to God which were missing in Jefferson's draft. Americans held strong religious beliefs in 1776 and the Declaration of Independence was meant to state the convictions of the country's good people. Jefferson wrote parts out on little pieces of paper and then integrated them into, a, in, into the manuscript as he presented to other members of the drafting committee. Uh, then he pulled them all together in what is now known as the original rough draft, which is the most interesting, but in many ways the most elusive document. It is owned today by the Library of Congress, which uh, puts it on display regularly. 
it was the draft as he submitted it to John Adams and to Benjamin Franklin, and there are changes on the original rough draft that are in Franklin's or in Adams's hand, and they are identified in the margin by Jefferson as Adams's or Franklin's. The delegates made no change, however, to Jefferson's concluding memorable pledge of our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. If you look at the Declaration of Independence as it was submitted by the committee, with all of Congress's editings marked in, one will very quickly notice something striking. And that is most of the editorial changes come in the final half of the document. And they're quite heavy editorial changes. Uh, they took out a lot. They even inserted new lines in the final paragraph. My theory is it gives us a clue as to how Jefferson wrote. And it's the same way many people write today. They will write the beginning and then at the end where they stop for the day, that's fine. The next day they go over what they wrote before and then go on. Uh, so they build up momentum and write more. Uh, the net result is that is that the opening of any draft is much better written than the conclusion. Congress achievement was remarkable. In just a matter of days, the Declaration of Independence became a finished work, politically aligned with the convictions of the American people. Finally, on July 4th, the Committee of the Whole reported its work was done, and President John Hancock affixed his now famous signature. Since before the Battle of Lexington, the British Crown had placed a reward of 500 pounds for John Hancock's arrest. As he signed the document in his bold script, Hancock said, His Majesty can read my name without his glasses and can double the reward on my head. Congress ordered the declaration to be authenticated and printed under the supervision of the drafting committee. It was copied by a fine penman on parchment. On Friday, August 2nd, 1776, the document was signed by all 56 delegates. The declaration was proclaimed throughout the 13 colonies by readings before large groups of people in public places. We have to think back to a period where there was no television, there was no radio, there were, there were not media. There was a medium, which was the newspapers. And not even the newspapers covered the entire country. There was a, a, a distinct area where, within which newspapers circulated. But there were a lot of people that lived beyond those areas. I, I find this rather touching. In Massachusetts, the declaration was read on the Sunday services in all the major congregations, because that's where you could reach the people. In Virginia, it was on court days. General Washington, on orders from the Congress, had the Declaration read to the troops. And we have accounts of this in New York, where uh, the troops were brought up in formation, the various officers read the Declaration. And the accounts say they could see off in the distance on Staten Island, the British, while the Declaration was being read. The first anniversary of independence was celebrated in Philadelphia on July 4th, 1777. And it was announced that thus may the 4th of July, that glorious and ever memorable day, be celebrated through America by the sons of freedom from age to age till time shall be no more. Amen and amen. Most historians, I think, and John Adams in the 18th century assumed that the celebration of independence would come on July 2nd. It was on July 2nd that the Continental Congress adopted the resolutions of Richard Henry Lee saying that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states. Instead, of course, we celebrate July 4th, which was the day the Congress issued the Declaration. The Declaration of Independence was first of all a justification for the American Revolution, but with time became not only a powerful statement of national identity, but a moral standard by which the day-to-day -day policies and practices of the nation could be judged. It was the crowning achievement for Thomas Jefferson, who died, ironically, on the 4th of July, 1826. He personally wrote the inscription on his tombstone 
and he identifies himself as the author of the Declaration of American Independence. Jefferson may object, however, to the way in which his document is quoted on the walls of his memorial in Washington, D.C. The Jefferson Memorial includes two passages from the Declaration of Independence. The first is drawn, of course, from the second paragraph. But it's important to understand that the first sentence of the second paragraph was very long and very thoughtfully and skillfully constructed by Thomas Jefferson. Uh, it included several phrases piled one on another in succession. And it went on through the greater part of the paragraph and ends with the assertion of a right, which was very relevant to the situation in 1776, the right of revolution. Everything led up to that. It was the climax. It was the point of the sentence. The passage on the Jefferson Memorial chops the sentence off in the middle. So it has the familiar opening about, uh, we hold these uh, truths to be self-evident. It asserts equality, asserts inel inalienable rights. It asserts, too, that governments are formed to protect these rights. There it ends. If it ends there, it changes the whole meaning of the sentence. It becomes equivalent to a Bill of Rights. The Jefferson Memorial II has, a, has the last paragraph in an edited version. They could only have a set number of words on each panel. There was a big problem, however. Congress had severely edited the final paragraph, took out many of Jefferson's words, and inserted instead the words of its own resolution of July 2nd, 1776, including the part that said, these United Colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states. Those were not written by Jefferson. They were written by Richard Henry Lee, and some other passages in the final paragraph are written by some anonymous congressman between July 2nd and July 4th. But there they are on the Jefferson Memorial, although Jefferson didn't write them. Abraham Lincoln saw the Declaration of Independence statements on equality and rights as a set of goals to be realized over time. As a great statesman and president, Lincoln did his best to develop and realize the Declaration's position that all men are created equal. Uh, in terms of the transformation of the Declaration from what it had been in the 18th century into, for all practical purposes, a Bill of Rights, a statement of rights for an established society, not of the right of revolution, we give credit to Lincoln. Lincoln was enormously eloquent. The Declaration of Independence was his basic text, his, his scripture, his political scripture. And he was an enormously eloquent writer and expressed his views in ways that are memorable over the ages. Uh, but Lincoln didn't invent those ideas. He shared them with members of the Republican Party. The Declaration of Independence was the creed of Lincoln's Republican Party in the middle of the 19th century, is the basis for their case against slavery. And after Lincoln's death, it was the Republicans who were primarily responsible for enacting the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the Constitution. 13th and slavery and uh, other forms of servitude, involuntary servitude. Uh, the 14th basically says that the states cannot deny people life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Uh, and, the f and the 15th Amendment says you cannot take away a person's right to vote because of a race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Basically, they were reading into the Constitution for the first time the provisions of the Declaration of Independence as their members of the Republican Party of the mid-19th century understood them. In 1863, Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, freeing the slaves in rebel states and it became a vindication of the basic principles of the Declaration of Independence, which he called the Charter of Our Liberties. On November 19, 1863, at the Gettysburg Cemetery, Lincoln delivered his famous Gettysburg Address. In his speech, he dated the founding of the nation not to the writing of the Constitution or the inauguration of our first president, but rather four score and seven years ago, 87 years earlier, 
1776, the year that the Declaration of Independence proclaimed America to be a free nation. Into the 19th and 20th centuries, workers, farmers, women's rights advocates, and other groups continually used the Declaration to justify their quest for equality and their opposition to the tyranny of factory owners or railroads or great corporations or the male power structure. And, of course, in our own time, people like Martin Luther King have looked back to the document and gave it readings and implications that others have not given it. His dream that one day the sons of former slaves would be judged by the quality of their character, not the color of their skin, was beyond anything Thomas Jefferson could imagine. It was also beyond what Lincoln believed possible in his own time. New groups and new causes embrace the Declaration, constantly readdressing the issue of what the nation's founding principles mean to new generations of Americans. Today, the precepts of the Declaration of Independence are closer to reality than they were in 1776. Conceptually, it's a living document, even though physically, the Declaration of Independence is now a yellowing parchment protected from total decay in a glass and metal case in the National Archives at Washington, D.C. What seems strange, I think, from my perspective, is the way we have chosen to display the Declaration of Independence along with the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Uh, in the rotunda at the National Archives, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights lie on the surface of what is, for all practical purposes, an altar. And it's meant to, we call, an altar. It's meant to be a religious display. And up above where the monstrance of the tabernacle would be, for example, in a Catholic church, is the Declaration of Independence. The whole display is laden with religious symbolism, uh, as if these were gifts of God. The truth is, however, they were creations of the American people, and they've continued to be important because the American people honored them. At 10 p.m. each evening, a guard presses a button that lowers it for safekeeping to the safety of the building's basement by means of an elevator. Each morning, it's raised again to be viewed by the thousands of children and adults who stand in line to get a look at this bit of American history. The major theme of my book is, I think, that we, the American people, have made the Declaration what it is. The early generations understood it very differently. They read it differently. They emphasized the last paragraph, which declared independence, not the second, with the statement of rights. Later, free blacks hold on to the document as, a, as an argument for the end of slavery and for equality in American society. Seneca Falls, 1848, a gathering of women, restate the Declaration of Independence so it reads that all men and women are created equal. It's an enormously useful document. And this idea of God-given natural rights is the unique, the distinctive contribution of the American founding to political thought. And I think it's an idea that is rightly emulated in other countries and uh, rightly sought by, for example, the forces of democratization in China when in Tiananmen Square, students marched to protest the tyrannical communist regime there. They waived copies of the Declaration of Independence. And I think that made sense, because that declaration is the document that teaches our rights do not come from the government. They don't come from any mere earthly authority, whether that earthly authority is democratically constituted or communist or some other form of authoritarian or totalitarian institution. Rather, they come from a higher power. John Adams had said that the American Revolution was in the hearts and minds of men, and there it remains. So we see over time the meaning of the document held too, held too firmly by people as an argument for an expanding freedom in the United States. We've made it over time what it is. We've made it far more than it was at its beginning. Every generation of Americans has signed the Declaration of Independence with its blood. 
And still we hold these truths to be self-evident. And still the echo of the words and phrases of this great American document reverberates across the world.